Okay, everybody. Well, we will go ahead and get started. And, and Jen, um, you can go ahead and hop off if you'd like to. Of course, you're welcome to stay too. Thanks for helping me get this webinar set up. And hopefully Jamila will join us at some point and um, I can just try to help her with her audio or present for her. Um, so thanks, Jen. If you want to hop off, that's okay. As long as the webinar does not end um, and we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody. This is Justine Allenbach. Um, if you wouldn't mind, if anybody could just throw in the chat or the questions, letting me know how the audio sounds. Um, I can make any adjustments if, if anybody cannot hear me okay. That would be super helpful to know. Looks like it sounds good. Okay, thank you. for Thank you guys for letting me know. Um, and thanks for being here. So this is the Skilled Assessor quarterly meeting. Normally, our second quarterly meeting of the year would have happened in April, but we did push this to today, May 18th, um, just because we had so many things happening in April. We have a lot going on with our HMIS transition, so thank you guys for your patience in allowing us to have this meeting in May, and thank you for being here. So my name is Justine Allenbach. I am the Coordinated Entry Specialist with the Center for Housing and Health, and hopefully we'll also be joined by Jamila Slaughter, who is a housing navigator with Facing Forward to End Homelessness. Jamila was having some trouble um, with technical things and joining, so I may present for her or um, wait to the end to allow her to speak to some things that are really helpful to housing navigators in our skilled assessment, um, but we'll go ahead and get started. So our agenda for today is as follows. We were gonna start with our Housing Navigator Spotlight and Jamila was gonna to speak to us about the notes on contacting the client section. From there, we were gonna spend the rest of today's meeting just talking about the transition to our new HMIS system, Clarity. And we'll cover the implementation dates of that meeting, the training dates to expect from All Chicago as well as um, as well as from the center and for skilled assessors. We'll talk a little bit about what we know regarding coordinated entry in the new HMIS system, Clarity, and then just talk a little bit about access into that new system. And if everyone wouldn't mind just giving me one second, Jamila is with us, but she is muted. So Jamila, let me just see if I can find you in here. One second. Okay. Jamila, do you want to try unmuting yourself? Trying to find your number too to be able to unmute you. Shoot, I'm sorry, Jamila, I can't hear you. I don't know why it's not letting me un unmute and I cannot find your phone number in here as someone that called in. Jamila, I'm just gonna move past the housing navigator spotlight for right now and try looking at this. And then in the next like 20 minutes or so, I know that you might have to leave. And if you do, that's fine. Just just let me know in a text. Um, but I'm just going to move on for now as I cannot find you in here. I'm sorry. Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll we'll come back to our housing navigator spotlight at the end of the meeting. So let's just dive right into the new HMIS system clarity and what we know and what I can provide to you guys regarding information on this transition. So as hopefully a lot of you know, we are transitioning to a new HMIS system in July and the new HMIS vendor is called Clarity or Clarity is what it'll look like when we log into our HMIS system. So what we have right now is service point which is just like the vendor that we use for our homeless management information system. And as of Monday, July 19th of this year, we will be transitioning to Clarity, which will be our new HMIS system. And All Chicago has announced that Monday, July 19th will be that go live date. 
I know that a lot of questions are going to come up during this, you guys, and I'm just so you know, there will be a question section at the end of the webinar, and I will answer all of your questions that I can in that questions and chat box, as well as you can unmute yourselves then. Um, but just so you know, I won't really be able to answer the questions in that question box right now, but I will get to it. So again, Monday, July 19th is when we predict or when All Chicago has announced the new HMIS system will be live and have the ability to start doing assessments, doing everything we do in HMIS again in our new system, Clarity. Training for all HMIS users, so just anybody that's gonna use HMIS in any capacity will be available in the All Chicago LMS, the Learning Management System, on Monday, June 7th. So that's coming up fairly quickly. It doesn't mean that folks have to complete the Chicago, All Chicago LMS, all HMIS user training on Monday, June 7th. That's just the date that it's going to become available to folks. So when you log into your LMS, which you might need some help with, I know not all of us are using the LMS anymore and you might've just used it a long time ago. And I know that All Chicago and the help desk will be really helpful with, you know, helping people get into the LMS if your password's expired, et cetera. So maybe give that a try, maybe play around with the LMS, reach out to the help desk, reach out to your agency technical assistant at your organization as well about making sure you have access to the LMS and the HMIS, just all general user training for the new Clarity system will be available on Monday, June the 7th, which is coming up fairly soon. Moving on, the skilled assessor training in the LMS will be available on Monday, June 28th. So that's a few weeks after just the general HMIS training becomes available. Um, we made this a little bit soon after because we just want everybody to have time to adjust to the new system in general, and then we're gonna make the skilled assessor training in the LMS available on the 28th, um, which will still give folks, I think it's three weeks um, to complete before we move into the new system on the 19th. Supplementary to just the LMS training, there is going to be a mandatory to all skilled assessors training webinar, similar to this webinar here on Tuesday, July 13th from 1 to 2 p.m. I'll get that webinar registration link sent to you all um, either at the end of this week or early next week. And if you have any conflicts with that, that is okay. We can make exceptions and we can send you recordings of that webinar. I know that everybody has different schedules and hours. Um, so this is just what we're going to make available to everybody for right now. But if we need to do supplementary mandatory webinars um, to adjust everyone's schedule, we can do that too. But for the meantime, just please save the date of Tuesday, July 13th for a mandatory skilled assessor webinar. And then also for skilled assessor support starting that week of June 28th, myself, Justine, will be hosting optional open hours every Tuesday and Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. So that'll be every week, those three weeks before the go live date on Tuesday and Thursday from 3 to 4 I'll send you all calendar invites, optional calendar invites, and you can just accept ones that you think you'd like to go to, or you can hop in into those sessions anytime um, and go ahead and ask me questions, get support that you need for the training in the LMS or just any element of the training in general. Um, so those will be available to you all as well. Okay, so if you have not heard as well, and, and this information should have been shared with all agency technical assistance ATAs at every organization, and hopefully this information has reached you guys, um, but All Chicago did announce that starting on Tuesday, July 6th until Monday, July 19th, the go live date, we will not have an HMIS system. And so, all I can share is what I know how this will affect the skilled assessments. And so during this time, we will only be having dedicated skilled assessors and the coordinated entry call center completing assessments. And we're gonna have these be done in a manner that can be transferred into the Clarity system easily. 
Um, although when we don't have the HMIS system, there's, there will be challenges in general to getting all of these assessments during the shutdown period into Clarity. So we are just limiting this to, again, dedicated skilled assessors in the coordinated entry call center. All other skilled assessors will not be able to do assessments during this shutdown um, as we just will not have an HMIS system. So I know a lot of folks are you know, concerned about this and we want to, during the shutdown period, ensure that folks have access to coordinated entry as much as possible. So if you have questions or concerns about this, please reach out to me and we can communicate. Hello, was someone trying to ask a question? Okay, everyone should have the ability to unmute or mute themselves. And just a friendly reminder, if, if you're not speaking or don't have a question, um, please put yourself on mute and we will designate some time at the end here for all of your questions. All right, then, Justine, I have, this is Sherry from Matthew House. I do have a question. Sure. In reference to the last slide. So who made the determination that all assess, the other, besides the dedicated assessor site with the call center, who, how was that determined that they yeah. would be Because we're a drop-in center and we get, a, we have a high volume of people who yeah. come regularly for that. So how, yeah. how do we get to be designated or dedicated for that particular time period? Yeah, yeah. So this was decided by the coordinated entry implementation team. Um, I'm a part of that team and, you know, I did have a say in this decision as well. I think it's really just about, we just have to, we're going to have to probably manually enter all of these assessments that are done during this period of time into the new HMIS system. And we don't know exactly how that's going to look at this time. It could be a lot more complicated, more complicated than we, of course, are hoping it will be. We hope it'll be able to move in there smoothly. But we basically are going to have to do assessments during this time in some kind of Google document and just record it manually in the safest way as possible for client confidentiality and then manually transfer them into the HMIS system once it's live. And so for client confidentiality and skilled assessors time and everyone's capacity to be able to enter these into the system manually, we decided to limit it to the call center and dedicated assessors. Um, one thing that I can offer as sort of a, you know, an in-between or to meet in the middle of these kinds of situations is our dedicated skilled assessors, we have some of them or most of them are traveling to different locations and different programs at this time. So we may be able to send one or two skilled assessors um, to Matthew House and your drop-in center, Sherry, during this period of time, like maybe once a week or more, and we can coordinate offline about that. Um, but again, this decision was made by the coordinated entry implementation team, and um, we can definitely connect more offline about this and um, figure out a solution that works for works for you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's move into what we know about the coordinated entry assessments into Clarity at this point. Um, so I've covered some of the dates and Please know all of these dates. I'm going to send a follow-up email after this webinar so everyone will be able to have those in writing as well. Um, but let's just talk about what we know about the coordinated entry assessments as we move into this new Clarity system. So the biggest change that we do know is for sure going to be happening is there's going to be three separate assessments now in Clarity. So how we have it now is there's one coordinated entry assessment and everybody does the same assessment, but, but depending on if you're a veteran, depending on these other elements, um, you might answer some questions in the assessment and skip others. And sometimes that gets sort of complicated. And also when you get to the vulnerability index and disability tab of the assessment, you have to decide you know, which VI to complete. But in the new Clarity system, skilled assessors will decide which assessment to complete for the participant based on some different eligibility things. But essentially there's a assessment for an individual, 
there's an assessment to complete for somebody that would be considered family, and then there's an assessment for youth. And so what that's going to look like is anybody that's an individual who's aged 25 or over and it's just themselves would do the individual coordinated entry assessment. Somebody that has minors in their household, so 25 years of age and older for the head of household and then has minors in their household would do the family assessment. And the youth coordinated entry assessment would be for youth, so anybody aged 18 to 24 years old. And again, this will all be writing and it'll be provided thoroughly in training to skilled assessors. So that's the biggest change. And something that's going to be really beneficial to having these three separate assess assessments is that now when you go into the assessment for a participant, it's not going to be whereby the skilled assessor has to navigate through different tabs, which was sort of complicated. Everything, including the vulnerability index, is all just going to live on one page. It's all going to be just one page, one assessment. You don't have to toggle between different tabs, saving and exiting as you go. Everything's going to live in one assessment, and it's going to look a lot cleaner and a lot more simple and a lot more user-friendly. So we will have three separate assessments, but it's going to make things a lot more simple. The other change that we know for sure is going to be happening, which I'm really excited about, is we're not going to be recording the housing history and length of time homelessness in the same way we've been doing historically. So for as long as I can remember for the coordinated entry housing assessments, we either had the housing history tool and now we're using our current living situation to document length of homelessness and it is essentially entering exact dates like a start and end date the type of place and that goes for the past five years and sometimes longer um, we have decided as you know the coordinated entry implementation team as we've been refining this assessment for the clarity transition that we actually don't need to collect length of time homeless in that way and it can be better captured and more client-centered to capture it by just asking the questions of you know prior living situation approximate date homelessness started number of times homeless episodes homeless um, which are just those questions that we call the housing history drop down questions that currently live below the current living situation in the assessment and so now skilled assessors are just going to be trained to answer those questions really accurately and save themselves a lot of time and sometimes save clients um, a lot of stress of trying to remember everywhere they've been in the past five years. So this is something I'm really excited about. It'll definitely be an adjustment, um, but we will make sure everyone feels trained properly and comfortable in doing it this way now. And I think it'll save a lot of assessors a lot of time in doing assessments. Um, and of course, again, if you have questions or feedback about this, please feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email and we can go ahead and do that. Um, so this is what we know for sure is gonna be changing about how we do assessments in our new system. Mostly everything else is still a little bit in the works and I don't predict any other major changes. We pretty much have the assessments in the new system figured out. Nothing really was, will be changing about them besides these elements. It's still mostly the same questions, um, but again, we'll have three separate assessments, which should save assessors from having to skip and decide which questions should or should not be answered. And then we're also gonna be changing the way we capture housing history and length of homelessness to be more client-centered and a simple approach. I also just wanted to touch base on supervisor access quickly. And um, some of you or many of you might wanna connect with me offline to talk about this in you know, more in depth, but we are only gonna be continuing supervisor coordinated entry access into the new system if you are supervising a dedicated skilled assessor. Otherwise, if you're supervising what we call a voluntary skilled assessor, you will not have continued access for coordinated entry access into the new system. And this, this decision was made for two major reasons. One is client confidentiality, as we've been working with our new vendor Clarity and creating um, the new HMIS system. We've, we've learned a lot about other continuums of care nationally, 
And we truly have a lot of people in our Chicago continuum of care that have this coordinated entry access, which is in a way the highest level of access you could have in HMIS because you have visibility to really sensitive client information, which is within our assessments. And so we just want to be more thoughtful and use more discretion about this access and truly only have it given to people that really need it, our assessors that are doing the assessments. Um, we understand that if you're supervising a dedicated skilled assessor, which is a paid skilled assessment position, then you will have access. Um, but supervisors of voluntary assessors will be able to see really accurate real-time data that assessments uh, or that skilled assessors are completing which should eliminate the need for having the access themselves. We have not had great data. We have not had an accurate skilled assessor dashboard for over a year now, which is going to be solved when we transition to Clarity. So again, just to reiterate, Clarity is gonna provide accurate real-time data on assessments that skilled assessors are completing amongst a variety of other helpful, helpful data points. So overall, our data and reporting is going to be tremendously improved as we make this transition. And this should eliminate the need for most supervisors to have coordinated entry access. But again, questions and feedback are, are welcome and we're making a lot of decisions right now. And so I'm, I'm happy to have more in-depth conversations with anybody um, offline. So feel welcome to send me an email or give me a call and we can get something set up within the next few weeks. Okay, so I know we are a little bit ahead of time on our schedule because we were going to have um, Jamila share with us. And Jamila, I see your text and I see that you're saying if I allow everyone to unmute themselves, but I think everybody does have the ability to unmute themselves. And so I just do not know why it's not allowing you to unmute. Can you, can you try talking? Okay, I still can't hear you. So Jamila, I will you know, give you this opportunity again as I, I do want a navigator themselves to present on this item, but I'm just going to go back a few slides and share um, myself about this housing navigation piece that I wanted to share with you all. So one moment. Y Yolanda said that you can't unmute. Let me just try unmuting everybody again or giving you that access. Can you hear me just? I can. Hi, is this Ali? I can hear you. So I know yeah, some I people can un the ability unmute. To unmute. Okay. Maybe, Thanks maybe for letting me know. Came, maybe the people that came in after you unmuted has to have to be on. Yeah, you probably have to reset to unmute. Yeah, let me try one more time. Jamila, do you want to try unmuting yourself? Hmm. It's a, she says, you could not unmute and the system is not allowing to unmute without a speaking code. Hmm. I'm, I'm so sorry, Jamila. I don't know why it's giving you so much trouble and it must be something weird with calling in um, but we will definitely give you this opportunity again and i want a housing navigator to speak to this um, but i'm just going to share briefly so i wanted jamila slaughter who is a senior housing navigator with facing forward to end homelessness to speak to this and um i really like perspectives of people that are doing this work in in the field so we will do this again either at the next quarter, quarterly meeting or before um, but I just wanted to speak to something that I shared with skilled assessors and beyond in the skilled assessor newsletter which is this section in the assessment called the notes on contacting the client so this is a part of the assessment that is not a required field technically meaning you can like continue on with the assessment without filling it out and service point isn't going to tell you you have to go back and do it but i just want to really reiterate the importance of completing this section of the assessment with really good detail because i have found that it often gets overlooked 
though it can be make or break that this section is filled out well in how we're gonna find and locate clients. So housing navigators do really diligent work to attempt in locating clients that don't have a working cell phone. You know, obviously in the ideal world, our clients would have cell phone numbers in the assessment that are accurate and they answer their phone. But I think all of us know that oftentimes clients' phone numbers change or they don't have that phone anymore and they don't always have alternate contacts we can get a hold of and they travel to different locations very frequently. So having information like this example that I've provided here can be really helpful to housing navigators who are trying to locate clients that have been matched to housing. So one example would be client is at the Harold Washington Library every morning from 8.30 a.m. until 12 p.m. on the eighth floor near the computers. So this is a lot more detailed than if we just put something here that said, client is at the Harold Washington Library, which is a huge library. It doesn't actually tell the navigator where in the library they would be able to go, and that wouldn't tell us what times that person is there. So giving really like accurate detail, if you can just think to yourself, if you were trying to find somebody that might be a complete stranger to you um, in a large location at a large library or at a coffee shop, anything um, that the client reports they spend time at, just giving that information that would help as much as possible and being able to find them in that location is exceptionally helpful. Another example would be every evening client returns to Pacific Art and Mission by 8.30 or by 6.30 p.m. for dinner and maybe in the cafeteria. Please call the PGM case manager for access to the building. So these little details are really helpful as well. So knowing where client might be in the evenings and in what area of the shelter they might be. And also little details like you have to call the case manager for the shelter in order to get in, like the housing navigator won't be able to just enter the, the building and walk around as freely as they want. A lot of these buildings have security and there's things you have to do in order to get in. So that's a really helpful piece. And then another example that I think is overlooked a lot is our ability to contact clients using social media, which is a lot of free platforms to message folks. So for example, client contact client can be contacted via Facebook Messenger if phone number isn't working. And then sometimes little details, like we all know sometimes our Instagram names are not actually our, our real full name. It might be something like, at Justine 25 or something. So having that information is really helpful, like someone's username on platforms like Instagram, but then even Facebook name, like an example could be client's Facebook name is Jane Doe parentheses Smith and Smith is the client's maiden name. Um, so just things like that, the really like just going that extra mile with the detail can really make a difference in if we're going to find this person and give them the housing opportunity that they deserve and that you as a skilled assessor has worked really hard um, in the assessment to do. And I think we all want our clients we see to have the best chance at being found and being engaged for housing. So this is one way that you can really make a difference in how we find clients. And again, Jamila, I, I would love for you to share with this, share on this topic again in the future, and we will re-invite you to share as a housing navigator's perspective. Um, but I just did not want to skip this piece today as it's it's very important. Okay, so let me just return to my, my questions piece. And I know this was a lot of information, and if I need to return to another slide, just, just let me know. Um, but let's go ahead and open it up to some questions that I'm sure you guys have. So hopefully you can unmute yourselves and um, please feel free to just speak up. Hi. Hi. Hi, uh, Justine, this is Tavis. Um, hey, Tavis. Sorry, this is hey, Tavis. Like common knowledge, Ari, can you just re-describe the difference between assessor or skilled assessors and um, dedicated skilled assessors? Definitely. I think I have an echo when I speak. Hopefully that ended. Um, sorry, you guys, if I'm echoing. But a dedicated skilled assessor, so we have 10 dedicated skilled assessors in Chicago, which are a paid full-time position 
to do skilled assessments or to do the coordinated entry housing assessments. And Franciscan Outreach actually has one, which should be your coworker, Samantha. And we have two at Facing Forward to End Homelessness, which travel to different shelter locations around the city. Um, we have three with the call center, and then we have um, one with our Heartland Alliance. And I think that covers all of them, but essentially dedicated skilled assessors are positions that are being paid for by the Chicago Continuum of Care to do assessments. And that's like their full-time position. And everybody else that is a skilled assessor is technically a volunteer skilled assessor, meaning their agency that they work for would, would like them to serve as a skilled assessor, but they're not necessarily getting funding from our continuum to do that. Um, does that answer your question okay? Perfectly, thank you, appreciate it. Okay, yeah, thank you. And I see there's some um, questions in our chat here about some of these things. So I'm just gonna read through these and answer these for you guys. Um, so one question that came up is what exactly is LMS? So I was mentioning LMS earlier when I talked about training for the new HMIS system. The LMS stands for Learning Management System. And it is a learning platform, a training platform that all Chicago is in charge of that new HMIS users and skilled assessors use to like get their training. So it's basically like a training module whereby you watch a few videos, there's a quiz and an assignment, and there's a link to that and everyone should be able to log in either with a username they may remember or you can create a new account if you don't think you've ever used the LMS. But anybody that's a skilled assessor or is an HMIS user should have used the LMS, the All Chicago LMS at some point because it's a requirement to use the HMIS system in our continuum. Um, but that information will be you know, shared with everybody. I'm sure All Chicago will provide the link to the LMS and support and getting folks in there um, as we move closer to these training dates. Another question, so I see one thing in here that says who's considered considered a dedicated skilled assessor, so I hopefully answered that okay for everybody. Um, another question in here says, what if a couple who are both 18 years old or 18 years of age with a family, which assessment to do? So if somebody is youth, as it stands right now, we're thinking we just always will want somebody that's youth to do the youth assessment, even if they're household size considers them as a family, I'm fairly certain it'll be that we always still want them to do the youth assessment, which will still allow us to say what someone's household size is. Um, so I would say it's gonna be youth, but if that changes, it'll be communicated when we do skilled assessor training. Another question is, what is the LMS link? So I'm just meaning, the link to a website. So there's a link to the learning management system. It'll you know, open you into something that says log in or create an account. Um, so when I say the LMS link, I'm talking about that All Chicago LMS, which stands for Learning Management System website. And I think that's all the questions I see in our question box here. Let me just double check our chat box. Don't see anything in there. Okay, would anybody like to unmute themselves and, and ask a question? I Let me see, Yolanda, I, I know that you were trying to unmute yourself. I I have on my end the best that I can figure out given everybody access to unmute themselves. So I apologize if you're still not able to do that. Um, okay, I have another question in the chat box that I'll answer. It says, I have a question that applies to both systems. If I encounter someone who was previously in HMIS under a different household, what do you do when they are no longer in that household? So that's a really good question. Um, there's gonna be some bumps along the road here as we move people into the new system because we're gonna to have to make sure they're entered into having an assessment that is appropriate, either the family, youth, or individual assessment. 
in general, so this applies for right now and will apply for when we move into the new Clarity system. If you see somebody who was previously listed as being a part of one household and they're telling you now that they're not in that household any longer, you can edit their household in their HMIS profile to be whatever they're reporting to you. And you can update their coordinated entry assessment so that their household size is what it should be. If you're having any problems with that editing, um, you can email the HMIS help desk and they can just help with any kind of like technical things that might be going on. I know sometimes when we try to edit households, things sometimes don't save correctly, I've noticed. So if that's ever coming up for you, HMIS can help technically, but in a policy kind of way, you can always just change or edit update the household to be whatever the client is reporting to you now and they don't have to stay as being a part of the household that they may have previously reported and then ali you asked if they were not the head of household does that matter um, so if the head of household reports that they have let's say let's say it's a, a mother and mother has a 19 year old daughter and the mother's assessment and the mother's profile says that she's a household of two a mother and a, and a 19 year old daughter but then you see 19 year old daughter at a separate program you know a week later and the, that daughter is like i don't want to be in you know my mom's household i would want my own assessment i want to do my own household just myself then what you would do is you just create the household for the client that daughter what she's reporting she can have her own individual household her own hmis profile and her own coordinated entry assessment and it's so so what you can do you you want to take the client's report we don't necessarily want to challenge people on their household size. It's just not really our position to do. And we just have to take per the report of whatever um, somebody is telling us, meaning we also in that situation would not challenge the mother who is staying stating her household size and that her daughter, you know, would live with her. But I think when it's a situation whereby someone is an adult, so in this example, the daughter is 19 and is an adult, then it can just be a conversation with that client who's the mother and just say, you know, I, I've i done the assessment with daughter and she has her own household, but are you sure it's, it's gonna be you two? And um, just kind of taking it from there. Sometimes it's case by case, but there's also a lot of client confidentiality things. So, you know, actually if somebody is an adult and is reporting they don't want to be in a household that one household has claimed them to be a part of, then we actually should not say anything about that and just document whatever people are reporting. Um, it's not going to, no one will be forced to be housed in a household that might be claiming them as being a part of their household. So even if in this example, mother and 19 year old daughter were matched to a household that was a two bedroom and mother is head of household and gets that housing match daughter can refuse to live in the household absolutely and then mother would probably be rematched to a household that fits her size of just one and i know that's kind of a complicated answer and this is something that does happen whereby what do we do when folks are reporting something and somebody doesn't want to be in that household um, we just have to be really careful with client confidentiality and what we can and can't tell people. And it's really just your role at the end of the day as the skilled assessor to document whatever a client is reporting. And then Ali, I see some more questions. It says, Justin, can I can I interrupt for a minute? Yes, yes, okay, please. So basically, the situation I encountered was I met a person who's living on the street. And I asked him if he'd ever been assessed before. He said no. So when I went to look him up, his name came up, but it was when he was in a different household when he was a youth. So now he's on his own. So do I create that that assessment in that particular household that he's already in, or 
how do you go about doing that? Because every time I looked them up, it came up in that same household. So when um, so when you looked him up, he did have an assessment done, but the household was listing him as it, it was just household. as a member of the household that he was no longer a member of. Correct. So if it's if you're seeing that within his HMIS profile, then what you can do is you can click like the edit pencil on the household and change that to be whatever the household is now that he's reporting. And then you can just, nothing would change in our HMIS system now. Like right now we don't have three separate assessments. We have the same assessment for everybody. So you would just do an interim update to his current assessment and just make sure that household details section of the assessment is listed as whatever he would want that to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, got it. Okay, okay. And we can connect offline to Ali about that. I know sometimes it's, there's a lot of coordinated or a lot of complicated things about our coordinated entry assessment sometimes case by case. So you can always give me a call. All right, thanks. Thank you. Hi, this is, I'm sorry, this is Michelle from the Early Intervention Program, the Night Ministry uh, Interim and RAP. My question is when entering the head of household and their minor children, it's been one assessment in regards to release of information. So how will we go about doing it when we complete it for the minor children under the age of 18? So for anybody that's a minor and is under the age of 18, should not have a coordinated entry assessment completed. We should only do assessments for people that are 18 and older. I understand that sometimes things are sort of at a threshold there, so people can be 17 or about to be 18, um, but there's supposed to be a minor diversion programs, um, which I can share with you, Michelle. Um, there's like a phone number, I think, through 311 you're supposed to call in that situation, but in regards to coordinated entry, if someone's under 18, we're not supposed to do an assessment with them for just legal like client confidentiality reasons that they're a minor Do, does that does that help i sorry if that doesn't uh, answer your no, question I'm exactly. sorry, maybe i didn't make my question clear for example i'm entering uh, a mom as head of household and she has mm -hmm. two minor children mm -hmm. and the okay. children are ages two and four usually okay. when, when we do the assessment for release of information you click the mom, yes, and the children also will come up automatically, yes. So how would we correct that when we're entering um, head of household and head of household, head of household's minor children? So head of household's minor children in the release of information that we have for our continuum, it gives the parent the option to choose what kind of data sharing to use for the children. Okay. And so whatever they report is what should be entered for them. Okay, that's fine. I understand. Okay. Right. And there's, Great. yeah, if you have questions about that, um, just let me know. I can send you an article from the help desk, the All Chicago website. But there, there is a section on the release of information that um, allows people to list the data sharing for their dependents, which would be, you know, children, minor children of somebody. So. Great. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Tianzella, I see your question. It says, for the youth, should we still refer the parent, the PT, to the homeless youth program with they have a family? Um, sorry, I'm not sure if I'm totally understanding that, Tanzella. You can definitely take yourself off mute if I um, and just ask me your question if I don't answer this okay, but I think you're asking, are we still like gonna divert some homeless youth to the youth diversion at Catholic Charities? What we're gonna be doing is we're going to have unstably housed youth sent to Catholic Charities for diversion. So unstably housed youth would be youth that are not actually considered literally homeless, meaning they're actively staying in shelter or staying outside or a place unfit for habitation. Um, so unstably housed youth could be 
youth that are couch surfing or kind of going from place to place and we will divert them to Catholic charities, which can provide them with um, some supports as well as connecting them to like youth transitional housing opportunities. It, they can also help with mediating with family members um, and trying to identify a safe place for them to stay. So we will continue diverting unstably housed youth to Catholic Charities Youth Diversion, which will be that information on how to do that will be thoroughly provided in skilled assessor training as we move into this new system. But any youth that is literally homeless, which again would be staying in emergency shelter or staying in a place unfit for habitation can have the youth coordinated entry assessment done when we have that youth specific assessment in clarity. I don't see any other questions in our question box here. Um, did you guys have any additional questions? Please feel welcome to take yourself off mute and I'm also monitoring our questions box. And I'm just gonna bring our slide back to that slide that has some of our dates. Um, so again, here's the dates we're looking at. The new HMIS system should be Monday, July 19th. The HMIS all user training will be in the All Chicago Learning Management System, abbreviated as LMS on Monday, June 7th. The skilled assessor training in the LMS will be available on Monday, June 28th. We'll have a mandatory skilled assessor training webinar on Tuesday, July 13th from 1 to 2 p.m., which will be in the same webinar format as this meeting. And then I will be hosting optional open hours every Tuesday and Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. starting the week of the 28th. And all of these dates I will send in a follow-up email after this meeting. If you know of anybody, any coworkers that couldn't make this meeting and would like a recording, I'm going to be sharing a recording with everybody either at the end of this week or the beginning of next week. And let me just check our questions box again, or of course, please feel free to speak up if you have a question. Okay, I don't think I see any new questions in here. Uh, I was gonna ask one brief question, Tim. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course. This recorder, yeah, I just wanted to know. Many times I come across individuals who are in bad shape, and I don't know how to say that they should be a priority. Uh, mm -hmm. How can I document document that in the system, or who do I email, or let me yeah. give you an idea. There was someone who we visited doing outreach last Friday. The person is that um, one of the parks sleeps in a tent. Uh, the, this is a couple. Uh, they're from Puerto Rico, hard to get their birth certificate. Uh, but the, the drug users, both of them, and the man is, uh, has lost already both legs. And mm -hmm. it's got a really bad uh, skin sores. And okay. they need a housing big time. But how do yeah. I prioritize that beyond what I can describe on my assessment? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. And I appreciate this kind of feedback and I know that this, this, this kind of stuff happens. And um, when I was doing assessments just at different shelter locations, I saw people in, in really failing health. And so especially our outreach skilled assessors um, can even see that in a more extreme version. And the reality of our assessments is that we can try our best to think of every situation and try to provide access to our system in the best way we can in a database in an assessment we're thinking about but it at the end of the day it'll never perfectly fit everybody's situations and it will never perfectly fit every single person that is extremely vulnerable in our community and so when these things happen you're always welcome to give me a call, Ricardo, and this is to everybody as well. You can call me, you can call my supervisor, Ben Darby. I think the best way to approach is in an, in an email so I can have it in writing to look back to, but we can sometimes address these situations when we see somebody in really failing health and at the end of the day, skilled assessors and outreach providers working with these folks, um, 
have things to share that sometimes cannot be captured in the assessment. And so we can case conference these client situations and use our brain power together to try and get them set up with something as soon as possible. We can sometimes um, just make sure they're on the high risk list. Like right now we're prioritizing people that are high risk for a severe outcome to COVID-19. And so we can make sure that all the boxes are checked, right? Like this client is, it sounds, it's definitely high risk. So they should be prioritized for housing. So we can at the very least check the first thing of making sure they are coming up on that high risk list. We can possibly work with our Catholic Charities matching team um, to make that match sooner and happen like sooner than later. So we are very open to like hearing things from providers and from you guys and case conferencing those situations. So um, at the very least we can do that and we can set something up to case conference. If you wanna send me an email after this meeting and we'll continue following up offline. Um, if that helps answer your question for at least right now. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I, I'm actually interacting with a couple of VSX right now. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as I have more information, I will, I'm going to make sure that I email you. I email you the HMIS numbers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Justine. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions, you guys? We have a few minutes. Um, some of you might feel comfortable asking questions um, separately. So I'm pretty available the rest of this afternoon as questions will come up and doing follow-up stuff for this meeting today. So if you have further questions, please, please feel welcome to shoot me a call. Um, let me put my information here at the end. So this is my contact information. That's my direct line as well as my email address. So let me know if you guys have further questions about today's meeting or this transition to clarity in general. Um, any, any last questions before we wrap up? Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for all that you do. I'm thinking of you guys and hoping that you are safe and taking care of yourselves. So thank you again for your time. And please let me know if you'd like to connect more offline with any questions, I'll be around. And I hope you guys have a good rest of your day and a good rest of your week. Well, thank you, Justine, you also, and everyone else. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Justine, thank you much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Take care.